All right, let's get to our top story now, which is Vladimir Putin and his big speech at the uh, Eastern Euro Economic Forum. Uh, and the highlights were coming fast and furiously today from this forum. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke there and accusing the West of a number of different things. We're going to kind of go through this speech and pull apart. I think one of the big headlines, though, was around was around grain. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to talk about this specifically around the, you know, the lies around the grain. We heard all these stories about you better open up the Black Sea. You better get all those grain shipments out of Ukraine because people are dying. Right. And the West was saying this is the reason all of your grocery bills were so high. This is the reason your gas bills were so high. But now it will get a little bit better because we're allowed to open up the seaports uh, through Ukraine. Right. He's saying, yes, that actually happened. Those ports were opened because sanctions were lifted. But the West did not send that to the normal channels of where it would normally be distributed. He's saying most Western nations kept it all for themselves and that this will turn into a never before seen humanitarian catastrophe. Let's listen to what he has to say. Excluding Turkey as the mediator country, almost all the grain exported from Ukraine is flowing not into the poorest countries, but into the European Union. Under the World Food Program, under the aegis of the UN, that is meant for the needs of the poorest countries. Only two ships have been sent, just two out of 87. It was used to export 60,000 tons of food out of two million. But that amounts to just 3% that has gone into the developing countries. In the previous countries, many European previous centuries, many European countries used to be colonial powers, and they continue to act as such. They are simply deceiving the developing countries. And I can say that if this approach continues, then the problem with the food is only going to exacerbate to our greatest regret, which can turn into a never before seen humanitarian humanitarian catastrophe all right so he's saying that only three percent of the grain that was shipped out which normally does make it to uh, the neediest places only three percent actually went on hunger relief missions that is two out of 87 ships <laughs> Uh, and he's saying the West continues its narrative, saying that that's our fault. It's really not once it like once it leaves those ports. Right. It's this is what does the West normally do with it? Well, now they're hoarders. Um, so they're keeping it for themselves. And then, well, of course, we saw who gets hurt the most. Right. Like African countries get destroyed as a result of it because they're not getting any of it. So EU just hoards it for themselves. Go ahead. Right. Dave. Well, and remember, too, they were blaming the mines that were in the, you know, that area. But that turned out to be Ukrainian mines, not Russian mines. So they were blaming them then. That was the, the, oh, like in the Black Sea. Yeah. Not yeah. Proven, not true. Yeah, that was I mean, and those were Ukrainian mines that had been there for a long time that they mm -hmm. they mined. Mm -hmm. And so they were having to go through with their own minesweepers and clear all those mines out. And of course, the Western media was like, Russia is blocking the ports with these mines. It's like, no, no, we have journalists who are right there telling you that the opposite is happening. Why is CNN parroting this bullshit? It yes. didn't happen. Now, uh, we pointed out in the beginning of the show that the reason we're covering this conference is because it's arguably just as important as the G20 conference, but you really don't get to see any of this if you search around any Western media. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big it's a Eastern economic forum, right. just as big as the G20 is for the West, although... Um, so anyway, uh, we don't get to see much of this, even though there are big decisions being made here for many Asian and Eastern countries. Um, and in fact, as a result of this meeting now, or um, because of it, now there are com there's confirmation that President Putin will meet next week with President Xi Jinping. So these battle lines continue to deepen, right? Yeah. Now, point uh, pointed. Putin pointed out, that didn't roll off the tongue, that the slumping dollar, the slumping euro, and the slumping Brit British pound are evidence that these currencies from these world powers are now untrustworthy and says that Russia will now move away from the use of these unreliable compromised currencies. 
Yeah, so is it, okay, here's what he said specifically. He said, Western countries have undermined the foundations of the global economic system. There's a loss of confidence in the dollar, the euro, and the pound sterling as currencies in which to conduct transactions, hold assets, and reserves. Now, step by step, we are moving away from the use of these unreliable compromised currencies. And by the way, he says, even United States allies are gradually reducing their savings and payments in dollars, according to statistics, he says. I will note that yesterday, he says, Gazprom and its Chinese partners agreed to pay for gas in rubles and yuan in a 50-50 split. Okay, so this is a big piece of the Cold War, right? As the United States fights to continue to be the world's global currency, it will lose this battle if these countries can work nicely and control most of the world's economics and just sidestep the dollar. Well, he's not wrong when he comes when it comes to the valuation of these Western currencies. We're talking specifically about the dollar. So let's look at the dollar. Over the past year, this is a chart, uh, I graphed it this morning, of ruble to dollar. Okay, the ruble plunged when the conflict began, sanctions hit, it did not plunge further. It has continued to dig itself further and further up. Now, now we right? had, you know, it's interesting, we have, a, we have a good friend who travels the world, he's uh, well read, he's, uh, you know, uh, um, very smart, very smart guy. But the the Western media narrative he saw, we were having lunch and he said, I, yeah, I heard the ruble tanked. I said, yeah, it did at first for like the first few weeks, like like a week, yeah. like a week and a half. It That's did. barely even one month that you see that dip. But that was all of the media coverage, right? And then there's there was very little coverage of the fact that the ruble rebounded to where it was and then accelerated to its highest level against the dollar and the euro ever well let's take a look at it against well, the euro ruble to euro right now same exact trajectory right these were all graphed this morning next chart ruble to pound same thing is happening right so the ruble is gaining on western currencies which is exactly what putin predicted when these sanctions were imposed he said we're gonna be all right you're not you're hurting yourself that's exactly what is happening now the dollar and the euro are almost on par they're about five cents apart um and we see now exactly what's happening to these currencies as they continue to lose value go ahead david well, I was just going to say, this is like propaganda 101. This is the equivalent of like when they do a blog post, they get the information out and then they come in like a couple weeks later and they edit it uh, because they got more information. And that's like the media went in, they said that it tanked. And so that's where people's mind stops because they're not going to go in and edit that live. They right. might have done it on a blog post, but who goes back and reads it? Right. right. He further said in this speech, this has not really cost us very much. Now, I don't speak Russian, so I can't parse out the rest of the content. So, um, you know, obviously it's cost lives. It's cost some people their livelihood if they can no longer do business between borders. That Those are real costs, right? But in terms of like the overall economics of it, he's right. Yeah, he. I mean, there was a couple of big points that uh, we, well, we touched on some of them here, the dollar as it compares to the ruble. But he says, I think the biggest, maybe the biggest point that he said was that Western dominance is dwindling. And I think you're absolutely seeing that reflected around the world. You're seeing allies who the United States, I mean, you're seeing it in, in Latin America, you're seeing it in Europe, you're seeing it some European powers. They're moving away from the West because mm -hmm. they see the writing on the wall. They're saying, wait a minute, where has this gotten us so far? Yes. Where has this gotten us so far? And uh, he says, you know, again, he, he called it the sanctions fever. He says the West caught sanctions fever as it sought to impose its will on other nations. Right. And he said the world is facing serious economic challenges. Unlike the impact of COVID-19, the current turmoil, turmoil is made because of Western nations' decisions. Yes. There's no, I can't, right. We've been saying that well, for months the thing, on the like, show. The dollar is only like the petrodollar. The only reason it's valuable is because it's what oil is traded in. But the problem is the oil is what's the commodity. That's the that's the valuable thing. And that can be traded in anything. So yes. it, the, the minute they start trading that in rubles and and the yuan or something like that, they like they work together. I, our dollar is going to like collapse. So why would they want anything to do with the dollar? Well, and also all the minerals, right? And other commodities. So it's not even just oil, which they're sitting on massive amounts of, right? It's it's mm -hmm. copper, it's uranium, it's uh, it's lithium. It's all of the things that China and 
Russia jointly, along with the other BRICS nations, can come together and form this new world order mm -hmm. and saying we're, we're backing our currency by things that actually have tangible value, right? The United States currency is backed by air. It yeah. is backed by debt. Remember, the United States was taken off the gold standard in the early 1970s. Therefore, the U.S. dollar is not backed by gold anymore. It is backed by debt. It is a debt-based currency and U.S. military might. We played Jeffrey Sachs' quote on the show last night where he says that is how Western authorities, that's how Western governments exert their power is through military might, right? And so if you are a debt-based economy with military, that's basically like your version of gold. Right. And so, of course, people will hear us speaking about this and saying this is pro-Putin propaganda. This is pro-Russian. This is pro-nothing. We're trying to listen to what he's saying, observe what's happening in the real world, right, so that we can react accordingly. So if we ignore what he's saying while his economy is the only one doing well, right, then we're just going to keep wondering, why are we hurting? We can't figure out right. what's actually going on. Our, we cannot believe what our leaders are saying, right? No. no, absolutely not, because our leaders are spending time talking about MAGA extremists, right? Instead of talking about, I was just was thinking about like President Biden today. Like, imagine if he had gotten up there. We talked about like the soul of the nation. Like he could have given a really powerful speech, said, you know, I'm going to throw everything out the window. I'm going to get up here. Americans are hurting right now. We're going back to the drawing board and we're going to fix this country. Like Americans would have said, OK, you just admitted some mistakes. All right, let's see what you got here. Yeah. You know, and instead it was I'm going to attack the people who disagree with me and I've got nothing for you. I've got nothing to give you. And at the end of the day, Putin's right. He also, one big thing that he said. Oh, no, he has something to give. He fights with outrage and propaganda, right? Which Biden. is, yes, which mm. is what the United States is really good at, right? Right, absolutely. And so, hey, you know, we now have a common enemy, which is MAGA. Does that make you feel better? So this is, now we're, now we're all on the same page. We're fighting ideology. Well, this Great. is their strategy. This all, by Go the way. Go buy some cheese. This all came out of a think tank. You guys, when you were watching like President Biden last week do his MAGA speech in front of the V for Vendetta red wall, like that came out of a Democratic liberal think tank in Washington. And so, too, did the idea of attacking Putin and calling it Putin's price hike, which was a total disaster. Right. No one believed it. Everyone thought it was garbage. That literally was workshopped and thought of in focus groups and think tanks in Washington. So then they rolled it out. So here's how we're going to go attack our enemies, our political enemies. And instead of focusing on Putin anymore, we're going to focus on MAGA as we head into the midterm elections. And that'll work. Well, we saw the first poll out today. Tim Pool had it this morning. Like The first poll out of that speech, Americans, liberals even hated the speech. <laughs> so, wow, you really screwed up. Um, anyway, another big piece that came out of this Putin speech that I wanted to talk about was his Asian nations section where he, he talked about Asian nations. He said most of the nations in the Asia Pacific, the APAC region, reject the destructive logic of sanctions. And he said, and they want to do business with people that will actually benefit the growth of their people of their own population and right. so you're seeing this alliance play out next week again putin is meeting with xi jinping the the belt and road initiative that's expanded across asia and through through parts of russia and into the middle east uh, you know out of china has increased uh, growth through that region tremendously um, and he says the abundance of countries like this in the APEC, the Asia Pacific region, is great competitive advantage and a source of long term development. So, again, where the United States wants to send warships uh, into the Taiwan Strait to show strength, right? You know, and like Okinawa is like, hey, why do you still have military bases here? Can you get the hell out of our country? You promised us, Bill Clinton, that you were going to leave many, many years ago. Why are you still here? Instead, maybe. Maybe this is the way to go about it instead of military might. I don't yeah. know, just a suggestion. Well, some of the other participating countries were Uzbekistan, Armenia, India, Mongolia, Myanmar, most of the Asian countries, um, as well as most of the Eastern ones as well. And so, you know, these people aren't messing around. They are going there trying to figure out how to actually build their economies while the West is messing around. Yeah. Right. Well, and, with and words, with even like today. So I spent some time going through the Eastern Economic Forum website because I wanted to read the agenda. Their platform. Yeah. Right. Oh, no, I just wanted to read what the sessions were. Right. right and right. then like because I'm a Western person and I'm I'm in a European country, um, a pop up popped up and was like, how can I help you? Do you want to talk about? It? And I was like, oh, am I allowed to? <laughs> I shouldn't chat with you. 
This well, yeah, not- because you can't see. Because <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> well, because the EU still blocks certain websites. I mean, isn't yeah. it amazing? Like the EU blocks like uh, RT and um, right. and other. And still, I mean, it's amazing to me that they're blocking like these these websites in a time. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, so one of the other big things that Putin talked about was the colonization piece of this. And really, this is where he really dug his uh, his teeth into the West and talked about the colonization of of the Western nations and basically says that they deceive these countries all the time um, by telling them they're going to be there to develop them. They are there to basically rob them, deceive them. I mean, we're watching it happen firsthand in Syria, right? We're, we're there to protect your oil, and except we're stealing it from you. Uh, so anyway, we'll listen to this soundbite from Putin talking about colonization and Western countries and, and tell me what you think of it in the chat room. Watch. В прежние десятилетия и столетия действовали как колонизаторы, так и продолжают действовать сегодня. В очередной раз просто обманули развивающиеся страны и продолжают обманывать. Очевидно, что при такой площа... при таком подходе масштаб проблем с продовольствием в мире будет только нарастать, к сожалению, к огромному нашему сожалению, что способно привести к небывалой гуманитарной катастрофе. So we deceive them and uh... You know, and I think that's absolutely the case. Show me in a situation where we haven't deceived the countries that we've set up military bases in. Silence. Well, and also look at all the countries like, like collectively, once they realize and they see a couple of countries like, oh, we don't have to um, fall in line with the U.S. sanctions anymore. You know, mm-hmm. like, because if you don't do what we say, we throw sanctions on you. And that's only because our, our dollars traded in oil. That's the only reason. We can do that. Yeah. You know, yesterday there was news circling around the Western media about the fact that Russia may be buying arms from Iran, right? And so... North Korea. North Korea. I'm sorry. Thank you. That didn't feel right. It came out of my mouth. Um, And so I was trying to figure out like, okay, this is the United States intelligence saying this to us. What what are they inviting us to believe, right? That this is a bad thing or, um, you know, that these are two bad guys working together. Or are they trying to say that their sanctioned, one sanctioned nation is doing business with another sanctioned nation? Is that proof that sanctions work? I can't, I can't wrap, I can't wrap my head around that. Or that they don't work. Right? Because I if think they're, both they're sanctioned- saying that it works. I think they want us to believe, like, see, we, we draw a line in the sand oh, around the these West, two countries. The West thinks that this is proof that sanctions work. Yes, because, that's what I think. I'm sorry, I didn't explain yeah, that well. Because the U.S., or, I'm sorry, uh, Russia is buying arms from North Korea. Like, that's yes. proof that sanctions work. <laughs> I guess because we're not buying them from Northrop Grumman. Or they're, they're not buying them from some U.S. defense contract? Right. I mean, we don't even know if it's true, right? And this is this was it came from a a, a war sort of think tank yeah. uh, report, right? One that we know to be skeptical of before. Of it, yeah. But at the same time, it's like I'm just wondering why so many media outlets picked it up. What are they asking us to believe? They're trying to sort of prop up our belief that Russia does business with bad guys because they're bad guys. Right. right. Well, and the Western media, of course, is such a joke because they're just relying on like the, you know, so these intelligence agencies come out from Washington and others and like, yeah, we got, yep. Western intelligence sources tell us that Russia is buying their arms from, from North Korea. Really? Is there any journalistic a, a proof of that? Or are you just literally regurgitating talking points from the Pentagon? No, they just wrote it out. Yeah. They're like stenographers. So as I mentioned, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, well, you, well, I mentioned Zelensky. We showed the little clip at the B in the pre-show. Zelensky going to the New York Stock Exchange via remote call-in so he can continue to get money and rang the New York Stock Exchange bell. They all applauded. He was there, the New York Stock Exchange, to raise some money. And then he got some extra money. He didn't even have to go very far because the EU, which is, of course, under enormous pressure, they're going to continue sanctions to their own detriment against Russia, but they that's not stopping them. Ursula von der Leyen tweeting this morning. They're sending an additional $10 billion dollars and the EU already provided. This is on top of the 10 billion. The EU already provided an additional 5 billion in macro financial assistance for the country. So, there you go. The EU suffering. European countries can't keep the lights on, but we're just going to send billions in aid to Ukraine. 